Hello and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. My name's Charlotte Higgins and I'm a, a, an author and a journalist for The Guardian. And it's my huge pleasure to be here with Mark Haddon and this is Linda Duncan, who as you can see has already got stuck in with her BSL interpreting. And so just before I have the great joy of introducing Mark properly to you, I would just like to do the boring housekeeping bit, which is, please could you put your phone on silent mode? Please could you not film or photograph the event? Um, there will be a chance to ask questions a bit later on in the event, so do think of your excellent, short, uh, wonderful questions uh, for later. And at, at the very end of the event, there will be a book signing which will be in the book signing tent, which is on your left as you're making your way back to the, the entrance of the book festival. So that's the boring bit out of the way. Mark Haddon's first novel for adults after a career writing and illustrating books for children and writing for TV was The Curious Instant of the Dog in the Nighttime, which was published in 2003, has sold 10 million copies around the world, was adapted into um, an extraordinary play by by Simon Stevens. Since then, there have been two further excellent novels, The Red House and A Spot of Bother. There has been a volume of poetry, and there has been a, a quite wonderful volume of short stories, The Pier Falls. But this year, um, Mark published The Porpoise. And uh, it's a novel that I really, really love, so let's not pretend that I am a kind of you know, neutral observer in this. It's, I, I, if you haven't read it already, I strongly urge you to do so. Um, it's an extraordinary work full of mythic backdrops, enormous landscapes, epic journeys. It darts dizzyingly through time and space. It's at once dense with literary illusion, but also one of the most sort of breathlessly exciting books I've read for ages. Uh, since we're in the New York Times' tent, thank you, New York Times, um, I will quote their review. Haddon's writing is beautiful, almost hallucinatory at times, and his descriptions so rich and lush and specific that smells and sights and tastes and sounds, foam smashing across a boat's deck, a breakfast of olives and barley bread soaked in wine, a woman trapped alive in a coffin, all but waft and dance off the page. The Porpoise is a provocative and deeply interesting work. Please join me in giving a warm Edinburgh welcome to Mark Haddon. Thank you. <laughs> well, well done for being here, Mark. Yes, because... Because, well, Mark... The, this novel was published in, in May. This is Mark's first public event to a, to a live audience, so we're incredibly privileged to be witness to this. Um, and the reason for that is that Mark kind of almost died and has had an incredibly dramatic and life-changing and rather upsetting yes. period of time. Would you like to tell us about that, Mark? Upsetting? It's quite interesting, actually. I had a triple heart bypass in, um, on the end of February, which I'm sure some of you know about. No angina, because I'm a runner, I knew something was wrong for the last sort of year or so. I went to my GP and said, I think something's wrong, and she said, it'll probably get better. But because I'm a pushy middle-class person who feels they're entitled to this sort of thing, I went to a different GP, and we thought it might be asthma or a hernia, and it finally sent me for a CT scan, and they said, dear God, you need to get in here really quickly. I was given an angiogram, where they put a catheter up your arm to your heart, and um, I sat up from that, and they s the surgeon came in and said, well, yes, I, we could fit some stents. You know, they put little tubes into your arteries, but I think you're more suitable for a heart bypass. I thought, shit. <laughs> <laughs> this all came out of nowhere. So and within, within, I think, three weeks, I was in hospital and having my sternum sawn open with a circular saw. The registrar actually said, he, he said, Mr. Sternum here, he said, it's quite a thick bone, but we do try to keep a straight line when we're going through it. <laughs> it was horrifying for my family. Um, it was oddly interesting being in the eye of the storm. I felt strangely calm. And of course, as Edmund White said, he said, you know, when you're being arrested for cottaging and dragged out of a public toilet by yet more policemen, you can say to yourself, material. 
So I, so I consoled myself by thinking, material. I mean, there's something really, actually everything you said there is so interesting in relation to the way that you write. Because I know from talking to you outside this room as well that you are really, Mark is really fascinated by his uh, medical experience. And he, he will now have to be stopped from lifting up his t-shirt to show you his <laughs> scars, uh, and which, are, which I do not myself wish to see. Um, it's not just my t-shirt, this is another interesting fact, if you like these facts. <laughs> They actually make two bypasses um, to go from the array or to the heart, but they take the graft, as many of you know, from your leg. So I also have another scar all the way down there. That I have seen, and it wasn't a happy day. <laughs> <laughs> Despite being the daughter of a surgeon, I still found that kind of a bit much. But um, the, reason, the reason I think it's really interesting, the way you talk about it, is that you, it does remind me of the way you write, that you, there is that you are capable of bringing a sort of relentless attention and realism to a scene, um, stepping back from, from something that might be extremely kind of violent mm. or um, upsetting, like 60 people dying as a pier collapses, and slowing that down and relentlessly telling us precisely how that works. 78 people dying in fact. Right, well there you go. Point, point See, I'm just hazy and inaccurate. <laughs> Um, which actually I think might be quite a good moment to ask you to read a little bit from, because I think we might see that in action. In yes, reading. should we go from one piece of drama to another bit of yeah. drama? Do you I'm want to just say what the book, do you want to vaguely introduce the say book? Say what the book is. Yeah, might be a good idea. The book is um, an extremely over-caffeinated and rather disrespectful adaptation of Shakespeare's Pericles. The Hogarth Press for a long time have done a series of adaptations of Shakespeare, and I felt I didn't quite have the chutzpah to sort of square up to Hamlet or Midsummer Night's Dream, because they're pretty good already. <laughs> and I thought, I, I thought I'd take on what am academics would refer to as one of Shakespeare's slightly crap later plays, which he co-wrote with George Wilkins, who is a one-time playwright, brothel keeper, serial abuser of women. Pericles is really not very good at all. There's only like two or three lines in it which have that sort of Shakespearean ring. He wrote the second half, we think. And one of those lines is the porpoise, how he bounced and tumbled. And I've always really loved that phrase. So the porpoise has become the name of a ship in this complicated freewheeling retelling of the story. I'm going to read you a, a short section from the opening chapter partly because if I read from any other chapter, I then have to explain why Shakespeare has suddenly appeared or why we've gone back to sort of the first century BC in the Mediterranean. So we start off um, with Philippe, very, very wealthy uh, man in the present day, and his pregnant film star wife, Maya, are staying with friends in northern France. Philippe has to drive the car back by the Eurostar to one of their many houses in Winchester. But uh, there's another... Uh, man there called Victor, who's flying his own small plane back with his son Rudy back to Southampton and says to Maya, why didn't you come with me? She can't resist. It sounds like a really nice idea flying across the channel. Philippe has his doubts, but it, always, it seems to fall into place serendipitously, so she decides to fly with him. So they go to the airport, and this is them taking off in their Piper plane. 30 miles per hour, 40, 50, they take off and Victor turns on track as they climb. He'll head northwest to Le Touquet, then north along the coast to Cap Grinet before crossing the channel to the Dover Beacon. They level out at 6,000 feet and Maya starts talking about riding a horse called Bombardier on the South Downs. The Clarendon Way, Ashley Down, Beacon Hill. It's superficial chatter, but she seems satisfied with a few well-placed noises of agreement and he likes the sound of her voice. Finally, she stops fighting the roar of the engine and gives herself over to looking down at the landscape so that he is free to turn every now and then and imagine what she looks like naked. 5,000 feet below, it's a jumbled parquet of fields, half ploughed, half green, patches of forest over Saint-Gobain and Noyon, the fat snake of the Somme looping down towards Amiens. The sky is cloudier now, the blue fading, the air a little bumpier. He radios Lille information for a heads up. A few clouds at a thousand feet, broken cloud at 1500, overcast at five. 
not perfect, but they're heading towards Latuke anyway, so there are no significant decisions to be made. And Maya is talking again about her husband's shortcomings this time, in a way which is sad and funny and surprisingly kind, so that Victor feels drawn into a circle of confidence from which he has been excluded all week. A sensation so intensely pleasurable when combined with their physical closeness that he pays too little attention to the slowly deteriorating weather. Over Abville, the cloud thickens unexpectedly. He loses visual contact with the ground and finds that his forward visibility has been reduced to the point where he can no longer distinguish the horizon. He knows precisely what he should do at this point. Carefully execute a 180 degree turn and get out of what is a potentially disastrous situation as swiftly as he can. If Maya were noticeably concerned, then this is precisely what he would do. But far from understanding the danger they are now in, she seems entranced. You can imagine it's Turkey down there, or Finland, very Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. It is the most foolish thing he has ever done. Their safety, her safety, Rudy's safety, is more important than any other consideration. But there is some caveman part of his brain which is profoundly averse to being seen as less than competent by anyone, let alone by a woman, and least of all, by a woman he finds attractive. The very act of turning over these thoughts in his mind has postponed the evasive action he should have taken by five, then 10, then 15 seconds, and convinced him that since he's on track, he will hold his course and, fingers crossed, soon emerge from the other side of the cloud. There is an American study, everyone quotes during PPL training, which says that the average life expectancy of a pilot who flies into cloud with no instrument rating is 90 seconds. It had always seemed to him like a tactical exaggeration. Keep out, here be monsters, or a measure perhaps of the number of idiot farmers in rural Kansas who use crop dusters like quad bikes. It is the speed with which he must read and react to the instruments which shocks him and the difficulty of ignoring the messages coming from his inner ear. Maya gazes out of the window unperturbed. It is less than three minutes since they entered the cloud. He is shockingly tired and starting to feel dizzy. His brain so desperate for some fixed point to contradict all these deceptive signals of lift and twist and fall and yaw that he is starting to hallucinate dark shapes ahead. The aircraft pitches and banks. He overcorrects. He needs to lose height. Maybe he can get out from under the cloud cover. A glimpse of the ground is all he needs. He loosens the throttle a little and gently pushes the yoke forwards. 2,000 feet, 1,000 feet, 800. Were he not concentrating so hard on keeping the plane level and straight, he might realize the elementary mistake he is making. The altimeter is set to sea level. He's not over the sea. He's over the land. Four minutes, five. The cloud is not clearing. There is a very real possibility that they are going to crash. He is unconcerned about his own death, but he cannot bear the thought that he will kill his own son. He cannot bear the thought that he will kill a beautiful woman and her unborn child. In his dream, Rudy is playing with his imaginary friend, Babu. They are back at Bellevue. It is night time and they have taken triangles of lavache qui rit from the fridge and made themselves big tumblers of grenadine and turned on the pool light so that the water is a turquoise slab of liquid light swaying in the dark. Maya looks across and sees tears rolling down Victor's face. He says in an oddly formal voice, I really am so very, very sorry about this. She is sick with fear for perhaps 10 seconds. Then the fog in front of the plane darkens for the merest moment before they strike the side of a grain silo. They are traveling at 70 miles per hour. The silo is empty, so they rip through the corrugated iron. The perspex windscreen splits and pops out of its frame, the snapped edge taking Victor's head clean off. They hit the far wall of the silo, rip through that in turn, then plow nose first into the hard earth. The wheels collapse, the plane pitches forward, and the engine block is punched backwards, crushing Maya's legs. <sighs> it, makes a, it makes a triple bypass seem like small beer, doesn't it? 
There's something about the dispassionate, yeah. godlike, distant, continuous present commentary that you give this catastrophic event, this human tragedy, which has a very particular effect as a reader. I mean, we could hear each other reacting to that. And that's just the opening of the novel. One's heart is pumping, and then the story goes on. And you take the reader on a very bold journey, the kind mm. of journey that you have not taken readers, I think, at least in your novels before. If, if a curious incident involved the plot of The Curious Incident, in one sense, is Christopher makes it from Swindon to Kilburn on public transport. <laughs> That's one way of looking at it, right? And back again. <laughs> other stuff, ha we, we don't want to ruin it, but a, a lot of other stuff happened. That this travels through time and space yes. and myth and reality in a, in a very radical way. I wonder how, did you, did you, how confident were you that you could take the reader on grasp them by the hand and say, come with me, we're not going to Kilburn, kids, we're not in Kansas anymore, we're going back to the first century BC, you know, we're going to travel through time. How, how, how confident well, were you that you could... Partly, a the collection of short stories I wrote, The Pier Falls, there are some quite bonkers ideas in there. The lovely thing about short stories, for me at least, is you think, look, let's set a story on Mars. If it all goes wrong, I've wasted a month, maybe two months. If you set a novel on Mars and it all goes wrong, you think, oh, shit, that was two years gone. So I, uh, there is a story set on Mars. There's a sort of version of an Arthur Conan Doyle uh, story set in the jungle in Brazil. Um, there's a version of Ariadne on Naxos. And I, I suddenly realized that you could you're allowed to be really entertaining in short stories, and also I was allowed to do plot as well. Plot's not a big thing in the contemporary short story. Mm. And those, those stories sort of um, awoken me to the possibility that you can just cram as much in as you want to cram in. So I think I crammed everything in. Claire, Claire, my wonderful agent, she said, when, when she read the short story, she said, Mark, you write novels in which nothing happens and short stories in which everything happens. <laughs> So th I try to write a novel in which everything happens. I remember you saying to me once before that um, you felt that if you continued to write the middle-class domestic novel, which is a very cruel way of describing your previous novels. I mean, that, that's a very limited way, but we'll use that as shorthand. Yeah. If you continued to do that, it would be like having the Millennium Falcon and using it only to get to Sainsbury's. <laughs> such, I'm just stealing his lines, but ju ju such, is, such is the, the capacious power of the novel, which yeah. you felt you could exploit in a, in, in a broader and more, ex more um, exploratory it's way. It's not necessarily easy, but it, yeah. not, there were no, no rules for the novel. You, you are allowed to do time travel, so a bit of me thinks, well, let's, let's, let's give it a go. Um, yeah, I travel through time and space. I had, I had such good fun doing a lot of it, in a way I've never really done before when writing. I also wonder about, I mean, this draws on, when I said that it's, it's a richly elusive novel, and, and clearly Mark has described that it, in a, in a sense, is a rewriting of Shakespeare's Pericles. And Pericles itself is a rewriting of layers and layers of um, mythic texts going right back to the ancient novel. I mean, you know, Pericles was an old story before Shakespeare and Wilkins wrote mm. it. So I think that's another thing that is very clear in the short stories is that you, you drew on myth very productively in order yeah. to create short, tight little stories. And, uh, and here you've used it to do something much more capacious and enormous. But what, what, do, you, what do you think you gain from writing or rewriting a very old story that exists somewhere in the perhaps in the sort of Jungian collective <laughs> consciousness. It's strange, isn't it? I get several things. To go back to what you said mm. about the curse of the Bowdoin novel, let's call it that. Um, the Bowdoin novel, as in the middle class, you know, mail order catalogue. The mail order catalogue. Yeah, OK. You, you, know what, you know whereof I speak. Um, <laughs> I'm not guilty you, today, but anyway, yeah. I mean, I grew up in a very sort of thin, monocultural white town. I was born in 1962. Yeah. and. Society is so big now, so diverse, it's really hard to write about what you know without feeling it's really narrow and constrained. And like I said, the novel can do anything. So where do, where do you go to find that really big canvas? Do you go, is it fantasy? Do you go to sci-fi? Do you go into the past? Um, I'd always find writing about history very difficult, because history doesn't... 
I had trouble, it's almost like I lacked the DNA to understand historical stories and was, never did it at school. But when I was rereading Pericles, I thought there was a different version of the past that Shakespeare uses, and he legitimizes it, which is basically, he mixes it all up together. And um, somehow he does it with sufficient panache that you never read through the plays and think, there seem to be Romans and Galleons in this one. Yeah. Um, and one of the reviews said, just referred to it as your. Y-O-R-E, the world of yore. And I realized you could go into the world of yore. And it wasn't about historical ac ac accuracy. It was about that kind of, if you write well enough, you could hold the reader's hand and say, come with me, and you can sort of take them anywhere. There was a really good review of Bringing Up the Bodies in the New York Times review of books by James Woods at the time, which I've always gone back to in my head. And he hates historical novels on the whole, but he loves Bringing Up the Bodies. And he focuses on one little passage where um, she describes the little leather heart-shaped bags on, on the long strings that the agents of the Fugger Bank were wearing around London that season. And he says, were they? Do we know whether this is true or not? Does it even matter? It's so plausibly correct that it works. You can write a novel that is absolutely correct historically, um, historically and bore the pants off every single reader being convincing is the one thing that really matters. Yeah, so you, cre you create a very log internally logical world that, could, that has never existed but yeah. feels real, which is a great. And of course, one does think of Shakespeare when you do that for, the, for, for exactly the reason. But to go back to this, this I bet, mythical stories, mm. even if you've never read myths, you know when you read a story, you think that there's some deep chime somewhere. I've vaguely heard of that. Any story that's got like separated twins in or a royal person dressed as a peasant. You can't quite remember where it comes from, but it's all there in, down or there. A child who doesn't know who they are because they, yeah. they, they're, not, they're, they're not the child of the parents who've brought yeah. them up, all of that, the, the sort of deep fairy tale myth yeah. motifs. Um, I'm curious about, uh, you, th this book is deeply concerned with women. Yeah. And there's a hint that there's a hint that the whole, without going into detail and ruining it, it I hope, there's a hint that there is perhaps a hint that the whole narrative is in some way constructed within a female imagination. Can I ask you about writing women, writing not you, not your gender, not your um, class, time, and place? <coughs> so which, is a, which is one of those debates of now, right? Is is how do we, how you know, when is it okay for us to write? And, these days, I actually mm. feel easier writing uh, from a female perspective. I mean, thinking a lot about both, my father died uh, last year, my mother's quite elderly now, and I mean, thinking about my childhood a lot, and I grew up surrounded by my father's friends who all played rugby. They were initially, you know, huge men in Slazenger V-neck jumpers and check shirts who'd never buy you a, an orange juice because you had to have a pint of beer, and they had these big belly laughs. And I remember at my parents' 50th uh, wedding anniversary, one of them came over to me and s slapped his arm around my shoulder and said, the funny thing is, if he'd murdered her, he'd have been out by now. <laughs> they were like that all the time. <laughs> they, were, they were scary, and then they were sort of just preposterous. And I thought, these are men. It's obviously not my club, is it? And then my father, who sort of left school at 16, but became an architect with a, a, a long but a very impressive route, um, decided that one of the things he would invest his money in was sending me to boarding school. Thanks for that. Um, and it was, a, it was like a small version of the, the rugby club all over again. I look at these people and think, this is not my club, is it? And increasingly, now I've had more, I felt more at home writing about women. And it started in the Red House. Um, there were two... Um, teenage girls, very different. One was very religious, but was sort of, um, had real sort of worries about her sexuality. She was very confused. And, and her not friend, who had that sort of slow motion shampoo advert hair, you know, very glossy and really hard work. And I sort of, I, there's no teenage girls in my life, but I started writing them. I thought, this, I feel very at home here. For about a year, I was definitely a sort of, um, evangelical Christian crypto-lesbian. <laughs> and uh, it just felt, felt like a good place to be, actually. <laughs> this story
story is a kind of act of restitution in a sense yeah. of the, the 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 narrative is sparked off by the idea of the story of the woman who kicks off the plot of Pericles, mm. who is a name she has no name. Should we say? Should we just say this is one of the things? The, the other yeah. reason for taking Pericles. It sounds rather sort of cheap reason to say it's a rubbish play, so I want to rewrite it. Let's merely say that there's a a, a woman who suffers the most terrible abuse in the play. I think we can say, well, in the play it's just called incest. Mm. And she and her father are treated as if they're equally to blame. Morally, it's sort of desperate. She's given two lines um, and no name, and then she's kicked away, the plot starts. She's used as a little springboard. And the only time we then hear about her later on is when a messenger comes on and says she's been killed with her father in a chariot by lightning, and they've been burnt to death by God for their mutual sin. So I thought, A, it's a play I can sort of do something with, and I can, ab I can abuse it mightily, because I don't actually like it very much. But I could sort of somehow right a moral wrong uh, by taking this woman who's kind of abandoned in the original and sort of putting her into the middle. And this, this connects with something I, both of us are kind of fascinated by in classical texts. Um, the idea of women telling stories, and it's connected with women weaving as well, and it's connected with the fates, and a lot of the book is about storytelling. Are we listening to being a story being told by someone else, or is it really happening? And there's a central image which is sort of just passed over um, in the novel, but is it's really important one for me, and I think it's quite important for you as well. It, it's um, in the Iliad when uh, Helen is up in uh, the tower in Troy, and she's weaving, I think it's called a great sheet of purple double fold, and it's a tapestry she's weaving, and she's weaving a picture of... The combats of the Greeks and the Trojans. Outside the window. And for me, it's really spooky, because every time I read that, I think, is she recording it or is she writing it? There's just this sort of little oh. moment when the veil gets very thin. This, one of the early commentators on that passage in antiquity, one of the scholiasts, said of those lines, here the poet has made a very apt analogy for his own craft. Yeah. So it's as if Helen, as he suggests, is either looking out onto the Towers of Troy and recording what she sees in art, or as you say, in a, in a more kind of postmodern way, she's constructing, she's constructing the entire story. I mean, it's, it's fabulous, right? Yes, I, it is very important to me too, <laughs> yes. And it's weaving as well, and weaving was always looked down upon as, I mean, it's, it's like at the Bauhaus recently. Uh, you know, at the Bauhaus, women were only to, able to do sort of glass making and weaving because they were sort of feminine arts. In antiquity, a lot of women are only allowed to do weaving, but you have a feeling that somewhere in the background, weaving is much more important than the men realise. Oh, oh, totally, absolutely, and, and don't... That's not, let's not actually start on that, or else <laughs> okay. we will stop talking about your book, which, which would be wrong. But, um, but talking of rest, acts of rest, restitution and righting wrongs, by a rather circuitous path, that leads me to ask this, uh, a rather sort of philosophical and broad question about what do you think the role of the novelist in society is right now? I mean, we are living in very, very peculiar times. Um, how does one... Can one, as a novelist, kind of tackle that, get involved in that? You know, to what extent does the porpoise do any of the work that politically one might want I, to um, do? I asked this question. I did a few radio interviews when my brain wasn't quite up to speed. Still not wholly up to speed, but I defi definitely wasn't up to speed, the first few radio interviews after the operation. And someone asked me a similar question. I sort of made this vague answer that slow writing and slow reading might be a, a an answer to fake news and the hot take. And then I sort of thought to myself afterwards, I thought that was just self-serving pompous wank, wasn't it? <laughs> That's the kind of thing that... We're all bookie people in here, aren't we? And there are lots of campaigns about telling everyone how good reading is. Proper reading is like the royal road to mental health and good citizenship. And I have to stop myself every time and say, well, wait a minute, this, we, I'm talking from inside the bubble here. I visit prisons every so often to run classes or do workshops or readings. Just put yourself in a prison and say, there's a lot of people here who just don't read. Am I saying that they are somehow a lesser person than all of us, um, or than me, because they don't read? No, that's a preposterous thing to think. I think literacy is hugely important, because if you can't read and write, 
you're more likely to end up in prison, you're going to be poor, less healthy, you won't have a particularly good job. <laughs> the other interesting thing in prison um, is there's always a small group of people who've read a lot, and uh, quite a few of those people have done some truly appalling things, and it's a good corrective to remind you that <laughs> reading, reading good books is not a guarantee. Of, of moral virtue. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I th but, to, but to go back to the original question, does it... Does it do anything when you write a novel? I think we've got um, correlation and causation the wrong way around. I think art, all kinds of art, are symptoms of a healthy culture. If your culture is alive, it's what you make and it's what you do. Um, I think it's Brian Eno who said, culture is everything you don't have to do. From whether it's from looking after the elderly and disabled or whether it's um, grand opera. It's what people do when they're, they're given space and they're made happy enough to create these things. I think the, the right answer is, in these times, what you do is you give money to the right charities, you go on demonstrations, you give a few hours every week to go and working for a charity or some community organization. You, and God, this is gonna sound like comic fans, comic sands across a sunset, but you know, be the change you want to see in the world. I know awful, but terrible <laughs> Facebook posts are actually correct sometimes. <laughs> and then when you've done a bit of that to try and turn the tide against these terrible things which are happening because of this loose global cabal of, um, of secret white billionaire fascists and their stooges, whether it's from Murdoch, Bannon, everyone, Julian Assange, so on, who want to just wreck the state. Do a bit of that and then go home and read Middlemarch and Beloved, and then you'll have a good day. You, you did allude just then also to how you were feeling, and I realised that in my excitement about the fact that you talk about your own operation as if you're writing a very cruel short story, I've, I failed really to ask you how, you, how are you, actually, <laughs> um, these days? Physically, I'm good. I can run an hour again, which is great, which absolutely scares rigid the nurses in the rehab clinic. They keep saying take it easy, and I say, how easy do you mean? And give me some science about that, and they're a bit woolly then. But I think, I'm a dog, I'm 50% I'm dog. I need to go out and run every day, I need to get out there with some puddles and some rain and some trees. Um, but mentally, there is still a sort of strange fog. Mm. Um, I get sort of slight recurrent anemia, but possibly it's caused by a really interesting um, condition known as pump head. I don't know who's heard of this. If you've been on a heart-lung machine, and I, ha I was on pump, there are two ways of doing the operation. God, you can tell how much I got into it, can't you? There's, <laughs> there's off-pump, which is really good in countries which, which don't have a sort of sophisticated health service, in which you work quickly, you slow the heart down, you pack it with ice. But the problem is it's <laughs> still twitching, and if you're going to do some really complicated knitting with meat, you'd kind of quite want it to sit there without moving. So ideally, you do on-pump, which is what I was on. So they, you know, they connect your blood supply here to a heart-lung machine. And it works fantastically well. The operation is one of the commonest and most successful uh, in the world. But there is, a, there is a cognitive deficit you'll get for shorter or longer term afterwards, known as pump head. And they don't quite know why. It might be due to the, your um, platelets or red blood cells being sort of squeezed between pumps. It might be that the plastic you come into into contact with. Are this you is just reminded me, do you want a sort of brief footnote funny story? Yeah, go on, absolutely. Uh, I got two teenage boys and I had to tell them what, what was happening as soon as I knew I'd have to have a bypass. And I said to Sos, my wife, oh, let's, let's just make it entertaining. So I sat them down and said, okay, we're gonna do a multiple choice. Okay, so one of these... <laughs> is this what passes for fun in your house? Yeah, it's fun, fun in our house. <laughs> okay. uh, it's one of these things that's gonna happen. A, we're getting divorced, B, <laughs> B, I've got cancer, C, I've lost a lot of money, we have to move out of the house, or uh, it's a heart bypass. And uh, they sort of looked at me, and then <laughs> Alfie said, think it's the bypass. <laughs> and I, was, I said, yeah, it's the bypass. And I said, but the good thing is, um, it's one of those big diseases that you can fix. You can then go in, they can replumb you, and you're sort of back to better than you were before. I mean, I have lots of friends who've either had cancer or have got cancer, and even everything goes right, you get cancer. It's always percentages, isn't it? You're clear, then you have a test, then you have another test, and you gradually sort of go back percentage-wise yeah. to normal. And um, I said to my oldest my son, I said, aren't you glad it's the, the heart disease and bypass, not cancer? And he looked at me and he said, doesn't give you a free pass on cancer. You know that, don't you? <laughs> 
like, fa- like, well, yes, he's learnt it's his father's knee, hasn't yeah, they he? Keep, yeah, they, they keep me grounded. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm guessing you're not writing at the moment, or are you? What's annoying is that my whole life I found it very difficult to come up with ideas. Um, I now have two cracking ideas, but my, I'm not quite 100% mentally. And there's something about writing which is a bit like, bit like being a surgeon or being like a pilot. You don't want to go to work when you're 90%. Mm. I mean, fewer people die if you get a novel wrong. Yeah. But there's something about, if, if, you, if you write at the only 85, 90%, you have to cross it out in the morning. You really need to, I can, if I'm writing well, I can still only do three or four hours a day, and then I know I have to stop and just leave it. And I'm not quite there yet. But for once in my life, I have these two really good ideas. And they come from realising that you can not just adapt old texts, but you can have a really rollicking argument with a text that you've grown up with in your literature. And there are two cases where I've looked at something I've read, known for a long time and thought, I could have a really good sort of mud wrestle with this, with this book. I can, I can borrow a shape um, and I can, I can interrogate it, as they say. But they're just sitting there waiting. That's so exciting. So it, it, so it feels like the short stories and then the porpoise have opened up a new yeah. body of work to you. Yeah. 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 I'm not going to ask you what your ideas are because you'll say I'm not going to do Because you'll all go off and do them. Exactly. <laughs> You've got to watch this lot, you know. <laughs> um, the, I, w- when you say you find it very hard to come up with ideas, um, I, I also happen to know about you that you are very exacting, you're, very, you're a ruthless self-editor, that a huge amount of stuff hits the, yeah. uh, hits the shredder or the delete button. Um, how do you know when it's good and when it's not good? God, it just takes years to get that, to get that meter working. Actually, no, it's not a meter, it's something very specific. And I often, okay, I teach once a year at the Arvon Foundation, and I'm always saying this to people. If you're going to be a writer, you already have that little voice in the back of your head. I don't know who writes here, but you know what I mean, don't you? The little voice that says, hmm, that's not so good, but you might just get away with it. <laughs> and um, you, need to, you need to find someone in your life. Well, you, you need, A, to, to, to foster that voice and make it louder and listen to it and trust it. And if you find a reader, you want someone who says things that echo what the little voice has said. So if someone says to you, I'm not sure about this passage here, you say, yeah, I knew, I knew all along. Um, years ago, a friend of mine, Catherine Heyman, and I were teaching um, a course uh, at Lumbank, an Avon Centre up in Yorkshire, having a great time. And there's a lawn outside the house. We we're both sitting in the evening at either end of the lawn. And it was a prose course, but one, one of the students had written a poem. And she said, oh, can I show you? Because we'll, we'll, we'll read stuff outside the classes, lots of it. She came to me and she said, can you have a look at this? And I read through it and I said, I really like this, but there's one line in this that just doesn't work because it's, it's explaining the rest of the poem. Um, and I just know it, you just know it instinctively. And she said, okay. Well, it looked at me rather grumpily. Then she walked down the lawn to Catherine and she showed Catherine the same poem. And Catherine obviously said, this, w- this works really well, but I think this line here ne- really needs to go. And because I, I remember her looking down the lawn at me <laughs> and thinking we'd done some kind of weird semaphore. <laughs> so after a while, I think you just get, it's like that little voice is the reader and you're the writer and you, get to sw- you, you learn to swap between the two really quickly. Mm. And in the same way that you can look at that poem and think that line just stands out, mm. Mm. Um, you start doing that to your own words. And th- this is a pure curiosity, you know, a- as a writer, talking to another writer, this is just pure curiosity, really. But you seem to me to be, you're unusually skilled at um, keeping the writer unhealthily awake and not going to sleep before they've finished the book. I mean, y- your books are fantastically edu- constructed such that the, the reader is, h- is, is completely gripped mm. and held. Um, are you, I mean, do you, do you sit down and think about three acts or five act structure? I know you've worked in screenwriting earlier on in your career. Never I mean, again. How, how do you, I mean, like, just like, how, how are you doing that? I, w- I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you hear so many writers talking about their process, and I just, I listen to them, and they've got this, everything laid out, and I just, I, I hope you're lying. I hope you're lying, because it's not like that for me at all. It's just like, 
wandering around in the dark trying to bump into something. I mean, I'm sure if you write um, a certain kind of genre novel where you have a similar character doing a similar thing, then it's relatively easy. If you want to come up with a, an idea which both surprises you and surprises the reader as well, I mean, where do you go looking for it? It's really hard, and it, I spend a lot of time like a, like a bear with a sore head in a cage pacing backwards and forwards, and it's made doubly difficult because the really good ideas disguise themselves. If an idea looks good, someone else has already got it. You know what I mean? So you need the, I the ideas which you know might, c might turn out to be brilliant, but on the surface there is something slightly unpromising about it, and you sort of take it home and you polish the mud off and you think, I think there's something here that no one else has noticed. So this, then it feels like it belongs to you. Then you can work on it. And maybe, maybe 50 pages, 100 pages in, it will work or it won't. Short answer, it's really hard. Um, <laughs> you find it really hard, don't you? I mean, there's nothing... Yeah. I, <laughs> I hate really it most of the hard. time. I mean, I, <laughs> you can't complain because it's not coal mining and it's not working in an abattoir, right? Your dad designed abattoirs, didn't he, for a living? He did. Yeah, I think he took my vegetarianism very personally for a <laughs> long time. <laughs> we, when we were kids, he used to bring home those big, I don't know whether they make them anymore, big dye line prints, which came out of the big dye line print, which is a long roll. And uh, if anyone remembers them, they were just slightly blue, like an old faded tattoo, and they had this amazing ozone-y smell to them. Anyone? Yeah, and uh, so we'd flip them over, and my sister and I would, using the crappy felt pens from 1971, would draw on the back. Um, but if you flip them back over again, there was quite often like killing room, blood <laughs> tank, feather store. <laughs> I think that tells you a lot. Um, I think it's time to involve everyone else in this conversation. Of Mark. Should we? Should we have the house lights up a bit? Two roving mics. Hands in the air, anybody? There's a hand right at the back there, and if I can place the other mic ready, if there are any hands in this part of the room, don't be shy. Anyway, we'll start here. Hello. Hi. Um, in your book, there's a, a lot of strong, resilient female characters, yep. uh, Chloe and Marina, to name two. I just wondered, because I, I really liked the story of Angelica, and I just wondered, what, what it was that made you choose to make her more passive, um, and in fact, maybe passive aggressive rather than um, more resilient and strong like the other ones? Well, yeah, I suppose, should we talk about this without me giving too much away if I can? Yeah, there's two very sort of strong, resilient women who d have adventures, which women are usually denied in most, in most stories forever by anyone. Um, but even though I wanted to put Angelica, the, the, the the name I've given to this woman who's just cast aside in the Shakespeare play. I, I think I wanted to put her centre stage. I didn't want to just flip it round and turn her into a sort of hero who ran around doing fantastic things. So that's somehow crass. She also, she's in a way quite ill, isn't she? She's in a way sort of psychiatrically ill as a result of what she suffers. And that has always fascinated me. The things the things that our minds do when they're under intolerable pressure to sort of cope with what's happening to us on the outside. Um, I mean, for, for long and complicated reasons, I talk to a lot of people who, who are in that kind of situation, who've been sort of um, twisted on the inside by what's happened to them on the outside. And although I didn't want to make her into a sort of hero, I thought, I'd really like to show some empathy to someone who is in one of these, been really sort of painted into a terrible, terrible corner in life. What do you do to make if everything add up when you have almost no options left to you? So I think that's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to make it a crass flip, but I also wanted to show empathy with someone who was really suffering. There's also a sense in which you might be doing what Helen does in the, but in the Iliad. I mean, it's possible. Oh, yes. We'll mm. talk about that later. Yeah, that's too... <laughs> ignore that if you haven't read the book, because that's secret. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm, it's the microphone with somebody. Are there any hands in, or hands that want to go in the air? Otherwise, I will continue to ask questions. That would be very... OK, there's a hand down here and there's a hand up there, so can we get the mics? Can, some, can one of you go... Round and about. Can you keep your hand in the air, person, so that I might will reach you and we'll come to you next? Hello. Hi. Am I on now? Yeah. Yes. Go for it. Thank I'm you. Here I am. 
Uh, did you have a lot of involvement with the... Um, oh, no, where have we I'm gone? I'm here. Yeah. Thank yes. you. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. One, two, sorry, three. Exactly. Yeah. Did you have a lot of involvement with uh, the construction of the stage uh, play of a curious incident? Because I couldn't believe, once I'd read the book, that anybody could do justice to it on stage. So um, I wondered if you were a link between the two. The sh short answer is no, and neither could I. <laughs> Um, I know people, let's not name names, who have, as it were, licensed their book for sort of stage or TV and not quite trusted the people who are doing it and decided to keep one hand on the tiller mm. and you lose a year, two, three years of your life trying to sort of steer that huge ship which belongs to someone else now. Um, and I didn't want that to happen, but I knew when Simon Stevens uh, read it and wanted to do it, that I trusted him completely. Um, Simon Stevens is not very well known unless you're a very theatre person in the UK. He is possibly the most performed uh, playwright under 50 in Europe. And uh, he's, he's quite Germanic and nihilistic. And a lot of his plays end up with someone being bludgeoned to death with a rock. And I thought, I can trust him not to be too sentimental. Um, <laughs> and I went with it. And uh, I just went home. We had, I said, Call me whenever you need help. He called me once because um, if anyone's read Curious Incident, you'll know that it ends with a maths problem at the end. And his maths is terrible. <laughs> so I had a long conversation. If you see the play, that coder at the end, I wrote that bit. Simon has conveniently forgotten that altogether, <laughs> but I made sure he gets, got the maths right. And that was it. I just stayed at home with my feet up. And my stroke of genius was just choosing the right person to do it and then going away. It's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. I don't think the mic's over here. Okay. Hello, Mark. The centre of the book, you suddenly go to the river. Where are we looking at? <laughs> Hello. I'm not speaking loud enough. No, no, no. no, no. no. Okay. In the centre of the book, you suddenly go to the River Thames, and there's Will and George floating down. Yes. I presume you mean to be the River Styx. Why did you do that? I found it a distraction. Um, yes, some, some other people did. On, if, you, if you go on Goodreads, there are some people saying, oh, I love this, it was brilliant, I really went with it. And some people saying, oh, there's some potentially horrible, I immoral subjects in here. It's a, it, therefore, it's an immoral book and I won't read it. And a third group who's saying, it went all over the place and I, I, I wanted it to stay in one place. The reason that I included Will Shakespeare and George Wilkins is because the book is an argument with both of them about the way they wrote the, way they wrote the book. And then I thought to myself, I'm on board the Millennium Falcon. We can use all these levers. Why don't I just go and visit them in Jacobean London? So, um, and in fact, I can say this, can't I? Because there's a creepy sort of um, foreshadowing in the book. Um, the one reason I can't really use my heart uh, condition as material is because I'd already used it before I had the heart condition. Uh, you brought it on. George Wilkins is, in fact, in the middle of dying in the book. And I thought, well, let's just go back and visit them. Uh, you're allowed to skip it if you don't like, if, you do, if, if it's a distraction. I, I give you permission. But I just thought, yeah, that's fun. Let's do it. Let's go, let's go and visit the person who wrote the original version of this story. And... Take a horrible revenge on them. Take horrible revenge on them. Uh, more on George Wilkins than Shakespeare. The second half of the play is... I think it has more moral integrity to it. The first plot George Wilkins wrote is fairly horrible. But it enabled me to do something else as well. I've always found um, history as a sort of school and academic subject really difficult to digest. I think partly because I, very early on, had a truly terrible uh, history teacher called Mr. Wakefield, who knew no history. And all he did was test us on dates. He had a brown briefcase, which he popped open on the desk. And he had a list of dates inside the briefcase, poorly hidden. And he just tested on them. Um, he's famous for having, people used to muck around in his classes, he's famous for having once hit a boy in the forehead with a thrown board rubber, you know the old wooden ones with the felt underside, it was then taken off to hospital. I mean that was what you paid for in private school in the sort of <laughs> late 70s, 80s. Um, and perhaps because of that, or perhaps because I have some problem with my DNA, history just doesn't go in very well. Um, and I have one son for, who does have that bit of his DNA, and it just, it just sticks to him. It's like tennis balls on a Velcro sheet, you know, field of the cloth of gold, dunk, sticks there. <laughs> the Hundred Years' War, dunk, sticks there. And I don't have that. Um, 
But I was working out how I could write history. And, in, and bit of me in those passages was realizing one of the ways you do it. If you're writing non-fiction history, you have to cover the subject you said you're going to cover on, on, uh, in the title, as it were. But if you're writing fiction, and you want to set a scene in Jacobi in London, you read some books about the characters and the history of the time, and you just cherry pick. You cherry pick all the things, the details that stand out for you. And then you weave a bit of the story so you can visit all those things en route as you go through. I mean, the best, the best book of all of those that I read was uh, Charles Nichols' uh, The Lodger, Shakespeare on Silver Street. Amazing investigation, one of the biggest sort of lumps of information we have about Shakespeare's biography. So I heartily recommend that. Um, so basically, they take a trip through London, seeing all the things which are the all the underlying details that I liked um, in the books I was reading about Jacobi in London. So that's, that's how I excuse myself for your distraction. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is over here. What, uh, what do you really like to read and what are you reading at the moment? Ooh, at the moment. What have I read recently? What am I reading at the moment? Um, at the moment, I'm rereading The Bluest Eye, Toni Morrison, because she died, sadly, and I'm sure, like a lot of writers, we're going back to the bookshelf and, and taking things out. Um, best things I've read recently, Olga Tokarczuk, who won the International Man Booker Prize. She wrote an amazing book called Flights, which won that prize, and then a more recent novel called Drive Your Plough Over the Bones oh, of the Dead. I just bought that, yes. Yes, yeah, it's great. It's a weird sort of eco-police detective story set in rural Poland. Do you know the thing I've had most fun with recently? Did anyone see Gentleman Jack on the BBC? Sort of, uh, sort of lesbian historical romp. I'm reading, um, and I finished the first volume of Anne Lister's Secret Diaries. Hmm. Uh, she wrote sort of... The source material for Gentleman Jack. Source Jones. material. Um, and quite different, actually, from, from Gentleman Jack. Um, really, really interesting. I mean, for, as a, from a writer's point of view, it has two... Wonderful sources of stuff. One is just uh, the weird details, you know, like you pick up and you sort of stick in your back pocket, like the visiting Madame to Swords Waxworks comes to town and everyone goes to see it, for example. Um, but also the, psych the psychology of her. In, the, in the, the BBC drama, they create the sort of friction by, by, by suggesting that her sexual relationship with the other Anne who got together with might be discovered which is a kind of quite a modern way of sort of figuring her. In the diaries, what's really fascinating, she has a quite a mannish presentation. One of the reasons she wears black is she feels kind of uncomfortable in dresses, so she dresses in black to make herself less noticeable. But she clearly kind of presents in this quite masculine way, and that causes discomfort for, from, f with other people and, uh, and with her original partner, who she refers to as M. And it's a very sad bit. She realizes that her partner, who, whom she has this very passionate sexual relationship, feels ill at ease with her in public. That's a terrible realisation. Now, that's, so that's a problem for her. But the sexual side of the relationship is almost not at all, because women's desires were so uninteresting to society at large, and because women were allowed to be very affectionate with each other, you could even share a bed with your best friend. That was almost like the irrelevant part of uh, what, what makes the drama now for us was, in fact, almost a side issue for them. She talks about having committed adultery with her, her married friend, but there's never any sense that the sexuality itself is immoral. She just says, it's me, unnatural. So that was really fascinating insight into a different mindset. You're getting into history, Mark. Don't oh, sorry, yes. Yeah. No, no, I mean, this sounds like your aversion, your lifetime aversion to it's history. It's cracking. It's cracking. Um, is the microphone with anyone, or do we need to direct the microphone to the front row? Are there any other hands? There are Thanks, many, Mark. there are hands up there, yeah. Wonderful book. Thank you. That very first chapter mm. in The Porpoise is yeah. chillingly gripping. Mm. How, where and when did your knowledge of flying occur? <laughs> there are several parts to that question. One, I've had a lifelong terror of flying. So there was something kind uh, of... Um, cathartic? Cathartic about, about writing that... Uh, that's um, situation. It's also inspired by, I won't say anything about that, if you ever get a chance to see the, the film Wild Tales, watch it and then you'll watch the first scene and you'll think, I know what partly inspired that, it's very funny. Um, I, I needed to, to get a baby born uh, with the mother dead, so I thought, well, let's do this in the most dramatic way possible. Um, 
So I knew I needed to do a plane crash. I'd also flown, sort of had five flying lessons in a Piper Cherokee. I'm a very project-oriented person, so to get over my fear of flying, I did lots of things, including flying lessons. Terrifying, but sort of sublime at the same time. And uh, so as soon as I got them into a plane, I thought, now I have to find out all the details. Um, I know someone who has got a pilot's license, and I just, you know, just get onto the internet, f find the technical language. And I didn't mention this earlier, but I love, what would you call it, the poetry of technical languages? Mm -hmm. It can seem pretty really boring, but if you dig around in the language people use within their own worlds mm -hmm. to talk about whatever it is, planes, potato farming, surgery, they're great words there. And a lot of the way I described it was actually dictated by not how you fly a plane, but the phrases I like best. <laughs> and Do not use it as an instruction manual. I think it's a um, take so home. That's, and that, that's how I did it. And I think, actually, that's not just an indulgence on the side. I think one of the reasons you make it chilling is not by necessarily burrowing hard into the people's experience, but just getting the language right. Because if the language is just right, people are sort of swept along, hopefully. And that's what makes it a bit roller coaster ride. And it really is. I think the microphone is over here. Please go ahead. What inspired what was the inspiration for the curious incident of the dog in the night time? Oh my goodness. Can I even remember that far back? Every book that I've written, and I assume it's true of every book that any writer's written, has many, many inspirations. You're always asked to come up with one, aren't you? In, in an interview, no one asks you just to list the 72 inspirations, because it's really boring. They want to say, you know, uh, it, was, I, it was something I found in the attic, for example, or I was reading another book. Um, I killed a dog with a pitchfork, and it seemed like a good start for a story. Funnily enough, one of the inspirations, <laughs> uh, and, and the sign of how many um, inspirations there are, I thought I told everyone what all these lists were. And then, as you do, I was flicking through lectures and conversations by Wittgenstein, <laughs> which I'm sure you all do, you do never, You don't live in Oxford for nothing, do you? <laughs> <laughs> and here, but here's the weird thing. On the third page, there are three smiley faces. And he's talking about the way we interpret expressions. And I thought, I had completely forgotten about that. There's a little bit of Wittgenstein in the middle of Curious, in the beginning of Curious Incident. Mm. So it, it's pick, you pick stuff up like that. But the main inspiration, the initial one, was me writing the opening to three different novels, in one of which a dog <laughs> is impaled with a pitchfork, a garden fork, into a lawn. My wife remembers vividly because she heard me chuckling in the next room <laughs> uh, at the idea, because I found it intrinsically very funny. And uh, then she said, do you think real writers laugh at their own jokes as well? <laughs> uh, He's a professor of literature, so, you know, it's valid. Uh, so it's partly that. It's partly finding that um, image funny and then thinking, let's, let's, let's find a voice which, may, which makes it funnier. There is something about, re something really appealing about quite flat voices. People, you know, you know, if you meet someone, sit next to someone on the bus who's very needy, and they want to chat to you, it makes, unless you're feeling in that mood, it makes you want to back off slightly. If you turn that round, if there's someone who sort of just says a little, or you have to, or you have to lean in and to hear someone's whispering, there's something very seductive about that. So I wanted a voice which didn't find it funny at all and was just very sort of factual, and I thought that'll actually make it funnier and more interesting and make you want to lean in, and that's that's one of the reasons it started like that. Thank you so much, Mark. We're going to have to finish our formal session here, but Mark will be signing books, and, and so you will be able to ask a, a question, a quick question to him then. But what an amazing hour of insight and inspiration. Thank you so much. Um, you. Everybody, will you just give us a chance to, give me a chance to conduct Mark to the signing tent before you all come out? But first of all, could you join me in thanking Mark for a great hour? Thank you. Wait, wait. Oh. Can I thank you and also urge you to read Under Another Sky and Red Thread? My books. Your books. Your books. books. They're fantastic, so please do. Okay. 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 That's very generous of you, Mark. Thank you.